Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm sure some of you are here just to see who all upset. Uh, this talk, we're going to talk, go into turning rocks into money. Um, I'm going to go just very broadly over economics, sort of like the big picture, if you will. Uh, then we're going to look at te technical studies, and I'm going to get in a lot of detail into metallurgy and, and such, because that really matters, and I think it's something that a lot of uh, investors and speculators don't really have a handle on. So I want to explain why that's important and why it works, hopefully in a, a simple way. Then we'll do some talk about open pits, underground veins, a few top picks. And following this, Mickey and I are going to be up here and um, have a little bullshit session, talk about what we learned over 35 years. All right, big picture. You've seen all this. Everyone's talking about this, so I won't go into detail. Um, but basically, we are not finding and putting into production enough copper deposits to meet with current demand and increasing demand. What this chart shows here is that both mine production and refined production in copper is down, yet demand is expected to go from 25 to maybe 50 million tons over the next 10 to 20 years. That is a big gap to fill. And this is copper discoveries. As you can see, they are not keeping up with production. Uh, and it's been dropping off lately. And the reason is not just it's harder to find these things, but the process to get them permitted, all the environmental issues, and such is just taking so much longer that if I find a deposit, make a drill hole discovery this week, we're looking at at least 10 to 20 years before that's in production if it's a large deposit. Same thing for gold. I think what's interesting about gold this time that's different than in the past is that major foreign uh, reserve currency outside of the U.S., they're... Uh, buying gold and replacing gold U.S. dollars. And a lot of that initiated when the, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and the U.S. and its allies froze their U.S. dollar assets. That was a trigger in their mind that we better not have so many U.S. dollar assets. And you can see here what they've been doing. And China's ownership of treasury bills has gone from $300 billion down to $2 billion. That tells you a lot. Gold discoverers not keeping up. Oh, well, again, these are your four major mining, gold mining companies, and you can see each one of them, their production has been going down over the past 10 to 15 to 20 years. That's good for us looking for it. All right, technical studies. Everyone's out there trying to do a PEA, PFS, whatever, and as if that's really the answer to your question. And the truth is, for the very early stage preliminary economic study, they're going to be with plus or minus 30 to 50 percent. And I can guarantee you that 90 percent of them are going to be way, look way better than the reality is. That's just what, the way it works. Uh, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. This is on our website. You can probably find that there. I like this slide. What it shows in brown are the current all-in sustaining costs for mines that are in production. That's in brown versus their reserve grade. And you can see they're all pretty well up there. And beneath that, in blue, are a number of undeveloped projects that have uh, studies done on them. And it's very interesting to me, to say the least, that all, almost all of them are better than the ones that are operating. That's not going to happen, right? So again, I go back to my point. These PEAs and PFFs are always, almost always, way over optimistic, if you will. Here's one that I found really interesting. Uh, Batero, a deposit in uh, Colombia. They've got... Uh, 1.7 million ounces at about 0.5 grams. They put out a robust PEA, two-phase CapEx. Uh, they try and stage the CapEx so the IRR, it looks better. 
NPV at 1750 gold is 481 million, IRR 32 million. That's their share chart. And you can see in eight years, their market cap is now about three million bucks at three cents. They've sunk almost 50 million bucks. And the total capex to build this thing, 420, it just ain't going to happen, despite what looks like a positive PEA. And these aren't isolated studies. Here's one for uh, Spanish Mountain Gold, another low grade, not easy deposit in British Columbia. They've done the uh, study capex, or the NPV 1.2 billion, 31% IRR, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a 0.76 sulfide deposit, and they're claiming that their all in sustaining costs are going to be less than the average of large, medium, and small producers. Again, I'm dubious. All right, so the primary reason for these busts, metallurgy is a, is a big one. Resource estimate is probably the biggest. Uh, it's really tough to estimate the grade of a deposit when you're dealing with a core hole from over here and one from 25 meters over here. You're looking at something that big in a complex deposit. It's tough. I mean, it, it is just tough to do that. Um, social environmental issues, always a problem now. And when the money's easy, the uh, bankers will raise money on anything. All right, let's get down to the, into the weeds here. Gold recovery. Refractory ore we're going to start, with, start off with. What this tells you where is the gold in the system. And in a refractory deposit, this is one thing that you, where it is. You can see on, that, on the, um, the big picture where the gold is. And that is within the crystal structure, within the crystal of a pyrite grain. So how do you get that out of there? In this case, it's got to be destroyed. Basically, you've got to destroy the crystal to liberate the gold. To do that takes oxidation of the pyrite. The quick way to do that is through pressure oxidation, where you've got a big plant, costs you know, hundreds of million dollars to build, and you break, destroy the crystal. Um, you can do that by bioleaching, maybe. Either way, it's a very expensive process. So a one gram deposit refractory is just not, it's not doable. It ain't going to happen. So in refractory ore, it's within the crystal, or there's other ways, but generally it's in the crystal, and that's what you've got to be aware of. That's why it's difficult. Okay, this is a different example. This time the goal is on the crystal boundaries, and that's much better because when you crush and grind the ore, the pyrite grains or whatever, arsenopyrite grains break apart, and that lets the cyanide have access to the gold. So you can leach it that way. And you can float it, leach a sulfide, concentrate it, um, cyanide leach it, and then run it through a plant. And those sort of cost in the order of 100, 200, 300 million ducks to build, so it's less. So these will work on Midas Gray's deposits, depending on size. There's a lot of other issues, size, where it's located, strip ratio, et cetera. Uh, large grains uh, will help. You can use um, gravity recovery. So we're, you're getting in the weeds here, but I'm hoping this makes sense when people start telling you things. Finally, uh, oxidite heat leach people. What's happened in this case is that Mother Nature has turned the pyrite into rust. Basically, it's destroyed the pyrite grains and the gold is already liberated. That saves a whole lot of trouble in the, in the recovering the gold um, and, and the process. So you can basically just, as this diagram shows, pile it up, cr you know, crush it, pile it up, dribble the cyanide on it. The cyanide leaches the gold down into the bottom. They recover the gold uh, via using carbon and then recycle it. Much cheaper. You can work depending on various things, you know, 0.5 to a gram works in those instances. And it's much less capex too. And on the picture there is from Liberty Gold and that's the oxidized core. Basically the iron has been turned to rust. The gold's been liberated. It's free. Okay, look at two examples. One, Liberty Gold, which is an oxide deposit. 
and Chesapeake Gold's uh, Metates, which is a refractory and double refractory deposit. Uh, you can see the market caps, about the same, close enough, uh, ounces. Chesapeake's got 18 million measured and indicated, Liberty about three. Um, market cap per ounce, this is a figure that you want to be careful and wonder why they're using that. Uh, market cap or enterprise value per ounce with Matates is $6 an ounce. Whereas Liberty, you're almost paying 10 times for those ounces. Uh, and the grade is very similar. And again, the, re the reason for that is one's refractory and double refractory, the other is oxidized and free. There you can see there's share charts. Disappointing point about this share chart is both of them react about the same to the gold price, even though one will never be built, in my opinion. So if, what Chesapeake has done that I find interesting is two th they've done three different studies, two PFSs and the most recent uh, preliminary economic assessment. And you can see the differences here. And why they keep doing this? Well, because it's not working. The first P, uh, PFS, 2.9 billion CapEx. They rejigged everything, got it down to 1.9 billion, but the sustaining capital went up. And in the most recent PEA, which is a lower quality to, uh, study, they've made an assumption that they can oxidize the rock naturally just injecting auctions into a pile and then moving it and heap leaching it. This is an untested, untried method. Um, so it's, it, it, we don't know if it's gonna really work or not. It's unlikely. Um, so when a company starts, keeps changing their way they're attacking the economics of the deposit, it tells you that there's something wrong with the initial idea and probably a deposit that makes it a lot more difficult. Difficult deposits major mining companies don't like to buy. Enterprise value per ounce. Again, here's International Tower Hill. You can see in, that's off their slide. They're selling for about 16 bucks an ounce. Chesapeake, six. And look over at Sabina, 212. Well, that's a much better deposit, that's why you're paying for that. So you want to be, you wonder why you're getting it for so cheap. Another enterprise value per silver equivalent ounce. And this one's different. This is uh, for Vizsla off of their recent website. Um, this is a high grade deposit, 380 grams uh, silver equivalent. It's a vein, it's a nice thick vein, a number of nice thick veins. We know the metallurgy is fine, it's very simple. The mining method is known. Um, this is a good deposit and it's gonna get a lot bigger. But the metallurgy, the mining methods, the, everything we know about it, it's, it's known. We know how it's gonna work out. So in my view, at, what is it, about a buck 70 now? That's a reasonable price if someone's looking for a quality, high grade deposit that I think another, a much larger company should buy at some point in the future. So here, enterprise value per ounce tells you a lot as well. All right, strip ratio on open pits. Uh, here's two examples. The top one, basically you've got a vein and they wanna go down on the vein. The bottom one, it's more of a disseminated sprayed out deposit. Uh, and the different colors indicate the grade of those blocks of ore. So the first one, the top one, is a narrow vein, flat topography. You've got 18 ore blocks versus 380 waste blocks. A mine is a terrible thing to waste, a friend of mine says. And in this case, you've got to move basically 22 blocks of waste to get to the one block of ore. What that means is it's gonna be very expensive. So you're, to mine that one block of ore, on average, it's gonna be about $44 a ton, or for block. The lower example, you're moving 103 ore blocks and 259 waste blocks. Strip ratio is three and a half to one. That comes down to about $2 a ton. 
two to three dollars a ton, much cheaper. And uh, that's seven dollars to, to mine that. So again, strip ratio makes a big difference. Keep that in mind as well. A lot of people go out trying to do strip ratios uh, on veins and they work a little bit at the top of the deeper you go, the more waste you've got to move. I'll another example, what, what a company did, they adjusted the pit to upgrade the grade, if you will, and leave a bunch behind. So in the original pit, there's four million ounces at 2.1 grams a ton. What they decided to do in the new mine plan was take in less ore, but a lot less waste. So they're mining one point, uh, sorry, 2.1 eight million ounces at four grams. Much more profitable deposit, even though they're gonna get less gold out of it, according to this. Narrow high grade veins, I've used this before. I think, you know, if you'd see me, you, I'm sorry, I apologize, but I think this is important to understand too. In the green is the ore zone. The white, uh, sorry, the blue is the quartz veins. Okay, we're gonna go look at that underground and mine that in this next slide. So again, the, the blue is the ore, the green is waste. The width of the vein is one and a half meters. Let's say that average is 10 grams. When you mine that, you're gonna actually also mine a meter and a half of waste. So that five grand deposit, sorry, that 10 grand deposit becomes a $5 deposit going to the mill, $5 per ton deposit. So right there, you've halved the profitability of your mine, more or less. Um, so look at that too, in terms of uh, looking at vein deposits, how much waste falls into it. Another issue to keep in mind is even within the vein, often there's internal waste. And this is kind of what killed Rubicon. Um, they didn't do enough infill drilling to define waste or barren rock within the vein, and when they mine the vein, that barren rock dropped the grade considerably. Because it's a very complex system. So it requires real vigorous drilling and testing and work. All right, picks. Um, I, I did this one this morning. Headwater gold, 21 million market cap at about 29 cents. Early stage, very, very bright, scientifically minded um, and focused exploration team active in the basin and range. They've got a joint venture with uh, Newcrest, which I think is stellar, where Newcrest spends eight and a half million this year, committed uh, on four projects. And all in all, they've got to spend 45 million to earn, that should be 145, no, sorry, 45 million to earn 51%, 100 million to earn the 65%, and produce a PFS on any one of these projects to get 75%. That's an incredible joint venture. The one project, one of the projects they kept to themselves, Katie in Idaho, around the Idaho-Oregon border, that's a real nice one, 100%. They're gonna be doing it. I'd keep an eye on that. Top royalty play, Origin Royalties. Good company, doing great things. They've got a royalty on the silicon deposit of Angle Gold down in Nevada, that's they're going to be increasing the, or advancing the resource on that. Uh, they've got a 2% royalty on a Mexican silver deposit paying about three and a half million last year. Uh, a number of partnerships, that's what their share chart looks like. I think this is a great royalty company that's going to grow by merging with someone or be bought by somebody. Uh, finally, a devil in play, uh, still in the U.S., I-80 Gold, Ewan Downing runs it. He has done an incredible job pulling this together. He owns the only uh, ref, um, roaster in Nevada that isn't held by the big companies. He's made some uh, discovery down in Ruby Hill, base metal discovery, and he keeps drilling high grade gold in his, um, the Getchell area. So this is, I think, a really good company, good group. It's something that if I was looking to move into Nevada from outside, I would be looking at acquiring. That's it. I hope that was useful. Um, Joe Mazumder writes Exploration Insights. I used to write it. 
I'm now his senior advisor, if you will. Um, lots of free information on the website. He's the most experienced analyst I know of writing a newsletter. <laughs>